uh, next we have uh, Wei Yun De Jong, uh, who's an associate analyst at um, Rabo Research, and we'll be talking about animal protein. Thank you.
probably uh, substituted by the novel ingredients. But it will highly depend on the availability of these novel ingredients. So far, high prices of fish meal uh, has been justified because of the uh, because of the unique composition of fish meal, fish meal because it has a good composition of uh, amino acids. And there are some possibilities that you can alternatives that you can use in aquafit formula. But which of them offers a similar mix, which is also available at a competitive price and at scale? So we identify four technology platforms that we see the highest potential. That is the uh, algal, oil, algal oils, insect-based feeds, bacterial proteins, and GM canola. I'd like to walk you briefly through this. Uh, so one of the main strengths of uh, culturing algae for algae oil is because of its sustainability and its high concentration of uh, EPA and DHA levels. It's highly sustainable because these products can offer one kilogram of these products can offer 40 to 60 kilogram of uh, the omega the, of wild catch fisheries that you can source omega-3. Uh, and it's also really good for the fish. It, it results in high growth rates, also highly digestible. Highly di digestible. Um, in the end, there are not there are many players uh, at this space. Some of them are the key agro key uh, agro industry aquaculture big chain companies, and some of them are more startup new uh, new companies. Uh, but for instance, uh, Terracorbi on Terravia, their product Algae Prime is actually being uh, used by premium salmon companies and the SM and Evonix product where Maris is about to uh, be commercialized. And when it's at scale, their expectation is that they will be able to respond to uh, the annual need of uh, the 15% of the annual need of whole salmon and trout industry. <coughs> And then the other one is the insects. Insects are potentially a solution to food waste and, and a, a, contrib a potential contributor to circular economy and they are a good source of alternative proteins and oils for, for human consumption and also as feed. There are different types of insects that you can rear uh, for food and feed production, but for feed mainly black soldier flies have been uh, used. So the insect protein has also a, a good, uh, has a high protein content. It also has hypoallergenic features, and it's also already in the natural diet of many fish. So consumer acceptance is high when you tell them about fly fishing or even spin fishing. You put a worm or a maggot on your hook to catch fish. And of course, they are also highly sustainable because you can use different feedstocks. You can use waste. Uh, you can use byproducts or you can use vegetable or uh, vegetable strains. As you can see, there are many more players in the space and most of them are at the startup level. But insects has been a media child. So they are getting attention, but with this attention, they are also attracting investors. Recently, AgriProtein has received the highest investment in the whole insect world, which was $100 million. But actually, Proteix is uh, leading the way on this space. They have already, the Dutch company Proteix, they have already launched the first insect fed salmon, and the reactions from the consumers and the companies were all positive. And the other one is the bacterial proteins, but you might not know them as microbial proteins or single cell proteins as well. And they are closer to commercial scale. Uh, operations in larger volumes. This is this sector also. They are not producing in scale yet, but they are close. Uh, Cardinals Calista actually dominates this space. They been they target to produce around 200,000 tons in the upcoming year, and they are Danish rival Unibio. <coughs> they just signed a license agreement with Protelux, and they already have a production plant in Russia. And they also target to produce 100,000 tons next year. And to produce bacterial proteins, different feedstocks can be used, such as methanol, ethanol, or other abundant low-cost feedstocks. And there's actually a new player 
This is a new land-based source of agave tree, uh, Giam canola, infused with algae. A new farm has been, Australia's new farm has been working on this for a couple of years, and they are uh, planning to be commercialized already next year. This is also very sustainable. One hectare of canola can offer you uh, 10 tons of wild catch, the omega-3 that you can take from the 10 tons, 10 tons of wild catch fish. And Cargill and DSM has been working on this as well, and they uh, plan to be commercialized after 2020. We also know Dow and DuPont has been uh, doing experiments with GM canola as well. Which brings me to my second chapter, Transformational Innovation in Aquaculture. We have seen already some examples in the first presentation with all this innovation happening in new farming systems in the uh, aquaculture space. And it's mainly to ensure biosecurity, to be more sustainable, and to reduce the risks in the sector. So if we look at the uh, salmon farming, in the most, uh, in the most uh, common way, uh, farming salmon on the coastal zones, it, is com it comes with its challenges such as sea lice or water quality or direct interaction with the direct, uh, uh, with the direct environment. But now uh, there are new technologies uh, such as farming salmon in closed containment systems to prevent uh, transfer of pathogens and also to limit water, water uh, exchange. Also land-based technology, there are, study, uh, there are lots of projects now in shrimp or salmon uh, to use rice, but this, they are not really contributing to the supply yet. We expect maybe not in two years, but maybe in the next five to ten years to uh, for higher volumes is coming from land-based farming. But currently, they are not price competitive. And there is the offshore farming, or or I should say, open ocean farming. That that is actually also new to us as a bank, and I am looking forward to learn more in the next two days. So I'm looking forward to hearing your opinion about the offshore farming. And, uh, and lots of innovations, the filature of innovations is, uh, is happening. That is, as we also have seen with the, in the first presentation, um, that, oh, I'll come to that later on, sorry. So <laughs> there are, for example, new vaccines, <coughs> that is for shrimp, there are oil vaccines, that is for shrimp or for salmon. And also to treat salmon, new technologies are approaching. For instance, there is the underwater lasers, that literally shoots the laser on the salmon, or deploying other types of fish to eat the paralyzed on salmon, or treating the sea lice, uh, treating the sea lice in barbots. They are all uh, approaching now. And also we see similar examples for shrimp. And in shrimp farming, modernization in shrimp farming has happened. That was uh, for the biosecurity reasons to prevent diseases such as EMS. So to continue to improve biosecurity, most of the modernization is for water treatment or health treatment that comes with the shrimp toilets or bioflock systems, for instance. And yes, that brings me to the innovations in the aquaculture system. So as we call it, aquaculture finally meets Silicon Valley. So IT in the industry is accelerating. There are underwater systems, cameras, as we have seen, they can be used to prevent diseases, so you can actually see it from the behavior of fish if there's a, a disease is coming or not, which also can be used for automated feeders. Again, by looking at the fish or the shrimp's behavior, you can actually tell if they are hungry or not, so this is a very good way to prevent uh, feed waste. Uh, and this, of course, because you are tracking all of this, you can you do the big data. You can go for the data analytics uh, for better forecasting for your stocks and so on, but also uh, for traceability, this is very important and which could enable blockchain solutions in the end. Um, so, so far I've been talking to you about the supply factors. And as I said in the beginning of the presentation, I'd like to talk to you a, a little bit about the demand factor. Because China has been the largest exporter and the largest producer of seafood, but now the driven appetite is changing, the dynamics are changing in China. And
and China will be in need of the whole uh, seafood supply from around the world. This is just to show you the appetite of China for the seafood. Uh, so standing alone, China is the, the highest seafood consumer. And even if you add North America, Europe and Africa together, we are, you don't get the same values for China. Because of the high population, but low, in, low endowment of wheat and land per capita, aquaculture actually has risen as a stable protein source in China. And mostly the farming of species that requires low feed or no feed uh, has been preferred, such as carps and mollusks. But the dynamics are changing in China. And we group them as the domestic supply dynamics and import demand dynamics. From the domestic supply dynamics, first of all, uh, the labor is getting sparse and more expensive. So China is relatively losing the competitive advantage of offering a cheap labor. And because of the diseases and pollution, aquaculture seafood is also decreasing. And the government wants to be more environmental conscious. So uh, like they did in the, hog, in the feed industry, they are closing some of the farms, also the aquaculture farms in China, or limiting the, the presence. And also in their latest five-year plan, they said they want to decrease the wild catch supply. So they are going for decommissioning or reducing their feed numbers. And very interestingly, import demand dynamics are changing. So uh, in most of the countries, when the income increases, the expenditure for seafood also increases, and the expenditure for meat decreases. But we see it, uh, we see that this applies, that it speaks true, especially for China. And the consumer preferences are changing. Chinese consumers, if they can afford, they don't like to eat that uh, carbon models that is uh, domestically produced in China because of the food scandals that has happened, for instance, and they like premium imported uh, authentic seafood options. And they can have it due to the online platforms now, as you all know, like JD Fresh, uh, G Fresh, Tmall, with, uh, like, uh, with a button on their phone now they can order lobsters from Australia, salmon from Chile, and so on. And also the infrastructure is improving. improving. Cold chain infrastructure uh, and logistics has improved, which enables the import demand. But because of these reasons, China, China, uh, Chinese produced seafood is becoming less competitive and exports are decreasing, but on the other hand, there is a demand for imports. And I put here the US-China trade war because I think I cannot uh, I cannot pass this when I'm talking about China. On top of all of these changing dynamics, because of this ongoing trade dispute between US and China, uh, the seafood trade from China to US will be mostly negatively affected. <coughs> because China is the biggest exporter of tilapia to China and also shrimps, but tilapia has already been losing market share, and with the, the added tariffs, this will only decrease more. And China is also not the only shrimp uh, supplier to the US anymore. There are some Latin American co co countries, but also the shrimp production as well as East Asian countries are increasing. So this will only lead to uh, the, net, the fall of net exports in China even further. Uh, and we identified to be successful in China, we identified actually four uh, key factors. In China, consumers have a preference of wild caught fish over farmed fish because they think it's healthier, or they prefer marine fish instead of freshwater fish, also because of the health concerns. And they have a long uh, history with uh, cooking with crustaceans, so they have a taste preference with crustaceans, but most importantly, premium. Premium products would be mostly uh, imported products. Uh, Mostly locally produced products are sold on the wet market, so they are not premium. But the premium product that is mostly bought online are the ones that is highly favored. So if you have one of these, there are chances that you will be successful in China. It's really high. So to sum up all of this, uh, aquaculture industry has experienced rapid growth in the in the last decade. In the last decade. And it, has, it shows growth 
great potential, but not only for further growth, but also for change, for adopting new technologies and also developing new markets. Uh, technological innovation played a big role, but also another important role that has accelerated the rate of technology is the investments that aquaculture has been getting outside the aquaculture world, from the agro-industry leaders or from pharmaceutical companies and so on. And uh, both supply side dynamics and demand dynamics actually allows for the growth. So using no feed ingredients or new farming and biosecurity technologies, new middle class approaching, especially like China, they will change the future of aquaculture. And from now on, I think the aquaculture industry will grow, of course will grow, but will grow in a more sustainable way. Thank you very much.